Hello and welcome back everyone. The theme of this event necessarily takes a bit of a look back at what the banking union has achieved and where it might have fallen short. Our next panel, however, jumps ahead to the future to take a look at banking in 20 years time, what that might look like and what that might mean for all of us. Let me hand over now to our moderator, journalist Jennifer Baker, who will introduce our panel. Thank you very much indeed. It is a delight to be here. As you said, for this panel, we are looking to the future, which means we are looking ahead at Banking 2040. So there are no wrong answers, which is wonderful for my panellists, as experienced as they are. So I'm very pleased to introduce next to me, Patricia Boydens, who is the Innovation Consultant and Vice President at Fintech Belgium and the Fintech Ladies Ambassador here in Brussels. David Martin is a Consulting Strategy and Regulation Partner at Deloitte in Spain. And finally, we have Marilyn Picaro, who is Director of Innovation, Conduct and Consumers <laughs> Department at the EBA. Thank you all very much for being with us. Now, we want this panel to be quite lively. You're going to look into your crystal balls and tell us what you see for the future and what might be coming down the road and hopefully a little bit of what you would like to see coming down the road. And we want the audience, of course, to ask questions using the app, using their online tools and here in the room. But we're going to kick this off by I'm going to ask you all for your elevator pitch, your three minute, this is what I think is going to happen and why. Patricia, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Jennifer. Um, yeah, what my elevator pitch three uh, minutes, then uh, I would say um, the absolutely uh, uh, trend I see is uh, open finance eh? and open finance uh, meaning uh, open data and of course data uh, control eh? because we had now the Data X eh, in February um, this year. And of course, the aim is eh, to make more data available because data availability eh, is uttermost important for the financial services industry. Because all these new technologies eh, like uh, AI, and eh, you have machine learning and all the connected uh, devices. So with this data, they can generate, of course, new financial products and uh, services, but it's only possible when data is, of course, accessible. So open finance, I know, is also within the EU digital finance uh, strategy, so I know it's one of the pillars, so that's what I'm explicitly referring to this uh, uh, here and now, because, you know, we had already PSD2, um, <clears throat> so there is already the reinforced uh, data portability, but that only reflects, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the, the current accounts, eh? transactional uh, data. But what I'm referring to is also make this data available of all financial products and services. So not only the current accounts, but of course add also savings accounts, investment accounts, but financial services doesn't stop with banking. It also goes beyond. So I'm also aiming towards pension schemes, towards uh, um, insurance policies. So with this open finance, people can take, of course, control over their own financial situation and have, of course, this holistic view on their financial situation. Because with open data and with all those new technologies, of course, uh, um, technology like AI, you can uh, uh, run the algorithm in order to see if your investment portfolio is still in balance with your own risk profile, for instance, or maybe you are over-insured or maybe worse, under-insured. So open data, new technologies, and that's the way to go forward. So I would say PSD2, then comes PSD3. Uh, no, not even open banking one. No, we need open finance one. That's what I mean. And with the data, with the new technologies, then we can build a whole new and better, of course, eh, financial product and services, more tailor-made, that be uh, uh, more transparent, cheaper, of course, and, of course, widely accessible and available because financial inclusion 
education, eh, education by giving those insights in those uh, new uh, uh, dashboards or other eh, products that will be possible. So that's uh, a bit my uh, elevator pitch. Thanks. Thank you, Patricia. <laughs> I'm sure we will talk about some of those issues as well as we go through our discussion. David, what's your vision of the future? Hello, I want to thank the, the, the SRB and the ECB uh, first for inviting Deloitte to the conference. I think it's very, you know, it's an honor to be in, the, uh, in, in this first joint conference uh, that marks the 10th uh, anniversary of the uh, anniversary of the banking union. So uh, I'm grateful to be here. Um, we were discussing the previous panel, the 10 uh, first years of the, of, the, of the banking union, and then we're looking at the next 20 years. I think, um, I think banks are prone to change. They've been, you know, they've been here with us for centuries. I think not many companies can say that. Mm -hmm. So one should you know, uh, assume that they will be changing with um, circumstances, society, technology, data, and everything that comes, and that's what we're going to talk about. Um, I think the last, you know, if we look at the last 10 years, and, and, and a lot has changed. Now we have bigger banks, we have less banks, uh, we have, uh, uh, I was saying before, uh, an architecture, an ecosystem we didn't have before, we didn't have the SRB, we didn't have a resolution authority or a, sup a joint super uh, supervision. So if we look at project, what the industry will be in 20 years, uh, who knows, really, um, it's, it's, it's very difficult. I think we can kind of um, infer from the challenges that banks are facing now what could be the future. No? And I think the, um, the banks are, are facing a, 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 a number of important challenges, like um, um, becoming the center of the relationship with the customers. I think they're as important as they are, they're not at the center as other competitors are at, at the moment. So. Um, keeping the role is, is, is essential. Uh, data will play a very important uh, part in that. Um, achieving sustainability objectives. I mean, they've been by the, by the, by the regulator, they've been put in a position where they have to be contribute to the ESG policies of the European Union, and that, that they're a very, you know, very important um, um, agent in that change. Uh, emerging technologies. Technologies, we will talk about that a lot in this, in this panel. I think that's a... Um, uh, banks have uh, traditionally invested a lot in technologies, but uh, the, the, the speed of, of change is, is becoming um, uh, incredible at a time where there have been low uh, negative interest um, rates, and low margins, um, uh, small profitability. So that kind of um, uh, make, makes it more difficult to, to, cope, up, to uh, uh, cope with the, with the big boys in technology. Uh, talent management. Uh, I think when I was younger, uh, working for a bank was, you know, very, a very, uh, a very good option. I don't think nowadays is, you know, what the what the um, what the kids have in mind when they finish uh, school or university. There are other startups and there are other um, places where they want to go. So they have a, the banks have a, a challenge in keeping talent. Um, Increase competition for new players. Uh, not so much existing players or peers, but new players, like uh, uh, particularly in payments, we see with open finance, we're, we're going to see uh, animals we haven't seen before. Um, of course, big tech and, and, and other things. <coughs> and, and of course, new business models have emerged as a result of regulation, but not only. No? And in terms of the trends, I think I would agree, uh, obviously. Data, I will call it, the, there will be two main drivers. The data economy, so everything about data, who controls the data. I think bank, banks in a very, are in a very good position. They have the trust, they have a lot of transactional information from clients, so it's not that they're not at the data center, but they, they need to be more so if they want to uh, be at the center of the relationship with the client. And then, of course, the uh, digital economy. I think digital economy is very important in terms of the um, uh, we'll talk about blockchain, we talk about crypto, we talk about um, internet, the new internet, uh, artificial intelligence. So those two trends will, I think, will um, uh, pave the way for um, the next 20 years. Well, thank you. And Marilyn, uh, your elevator pitch, we're calling it, but your, your opening thoughts on, on what you see in your crystal ball. Yes, thank you. Thank you for giving the world and I'm honored to be here and, and share my thoughts. Uh, so I, I would uh, list four or five key things uh, that I have in mind uh, for the next 20 years uh, perspective. First of all, um, it is likely that we are reconsidering what is a, a customer-centric uh, service model or customer-centric approach 
to the financial services overall. And uh, what I mean by that is uh, a customer most likely in the future is not the one who is chase, chasing the bank or chasing any service provider. It should be seamless for him or her. Uh, all the needs the customer has are kind of predicted and managed uh, uh, by the financial institutions without direct orders from the customer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will elaborate later what this potentially could mean and then what are the considerations here. Uh, secondly, um, my thinking is around uh, uh, financial services for everyone. Uh, unfortunately, I still see that uh, we are largely fragmented uh, based on some years old data by the World Bank uh, still indicated that uh, across the European Union we still have 30 million adult, uh, adult citizens without uh, access to the regulated banking services. Um, most recent numbers most probably are on their way. So I, I'm just wondering, you know, what those 30 million uh, adults then are doing and they are actually excluded uh, then from other uh, opportunities they would have either in the job market or social benefits and we are actually increasing the poverty, inequality, etc. So uh, basically banking for everyone, uh, despite your geographical location, gender, income level, uh, whether you are in the big city or rural area. Um, going forward here, thirdly, um, now if uh, looking more to the uh, financial institution side, uh, uh, most processes are, uh, are automated or automatic. So um, obviously servicing all the customers in the world or all the customers uh, in the European Union uh, uh, financial institutions must think about their uh, unit cost uh, and there is hardly uh, room for the manual uh, works. And that also applies to the, now to the other side, uh, controls, monitoring and also policy development and the supervisory activities as it's uh, often I use the term invisible uh, controls or invisible compliance. How we ensure that we actually meet all the requirements uh, that we are not even able to catch up with, uh, but in a way that it doesn't require manual work. Uh, uh, so that's uh, one topic to discuss a bit later. And lastly, I would touch the, the obviously the awareness. So uh, uh, those uh, young citizens who are today in the kindergarten are the ones who are making difference <coughs> in 2040. So what we are teaching them now and whether we are teaching the right things uh, for, for them, for the future. Um, yes, I would stop here. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't expecting any easy answers, but I think we've got a lot to dig into there. I think, Patricia, let's start with, it sounded to me that a lot of you were thinking in terms of evolution rather than some sort of crisis-driven revolution. But I think we also heard um, ideas of innovation and that sort of innovation needs to be driven by something. And I'm curious, what do you see as the sort of the main challenges or the main drivers to sort of innovation in the fintech sector? And mm. is there anything that regulators or policymakers could be doing to foster an innovation-friendly environment that also still mm. protects consumers? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the word has already fallen in the eh, the, the 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 other uh, uh, panel at the during the, the the last debate, and of course one one of the biggest trends of innovation that we see right now has everything to do with uh, decentralized finance and the uh, Web Web uh, 3.0. Mm -hmm. eh? So uh, of course my my. Uh, let's say my speech was all about open data. Of course, those technologies, uh, the distrib distributed uh, ledger technology needs data. Eh? Otherwise, it can't uh, uh, work. And also, um, also David already briefly uh, touched it upon the, the web po point three. It's all about digital economy, but also the uh, uh, ownership economy. Eh? So it will be... Um, of course, um, Rome wasn't built in a day, eh? and, and evolution also comes 
in waves, but in 20 years' time, for sure, decentralized uh, finance will uh, change the way how we look at money now. Eh? It's, uh, it will be a, a, a completely other setting, decentralized, uh, uh, meaning that now um, financial institutions, eh? it's a board or the exco that takes eh, a strategic, a strategic uh, uh, decision, decentralized finance, you will have maybe one DAO taken as a community, they will take the decision based on their rules and their procedures, and there will be no one individual who can break the blockchain. Eh? That's, that's not what this technology yeah. is built, <laughs> yes. So um, I think that will be the game changer, but of course, regulation also must follow. We have Mika, luckily, eh? because I know a lot of fintechs, a lot of uh, fintechs also involved in, in, in blockchain projects, in, in digital assets, in uh, cryptocurrencies. They were really, they are demanding this regulation because it needs to be transparent. There needs to be customer protection, of course. They are, they are really asking for this kind of uh, uh, legislations. And it will be the same for other uh, decentralized uh, finance products and, and services, and we need regulation because also we need standardization. As you know, now we have more than, what was it, 18,000 different kind of uh, cryptocurrencies, and of course not, not all of them are going to survive. So, But we need the, 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 the regulatory framework also for the standardization. It was all only recent in the press that uh, Meta eh, has made, uh, has joined a kind of a, a Metaverse forum eh, with several other important players like Microsoft, like uh, Alibaba. And now they are trying to build one eh, centralized, one standard eh, for mm -hmm. uh, uh, standardizing the uh, Metaverse. So means for me, regulation, standardization, and that's the way forward with this uh, new uh, Web uh, 3.0. Yeah. Well, I'm going to build on what you've just said because I want to bring Marilyn in from the regulatory side and mm -hmm. ask what sort of regulatory rules, what sort of supervision do we need to see with this sort of innovation that we're talking about? And in fact, I see here um, a question in from our audience already asking about whether there's a concern between the lag between the old people, as they put it, making legislation, and the young people developing banking and finance technology. And, you know, some old people <laughs> make innovative yeah. things as well. Um, so how can the EU regulate if they're not even aware of the tech? It's a challenge, Marilyn, I presume. Yes, I, I, I have honourable role to be a director for the innovation department at EBA. So we are the ones who should understand and write guidelines uh, covering the innovation. I don't consider myself too old yet. Um, uh, and uh, I can confirm that uh, most of my team members, uh, I haven't asked their age, but they seem to be not old yet and they're not retiring anytime soon. So rather young, uh, uh, enthusiastic team. But um, um, there are a few uh, uh, obvious uh, challenges, obviously, so that uh, Regulation is always about the past. I mean, majority is about the past. So this is at least how the practice uh, uh, largely is, because it's very hard to regulate something that potentially comes in the future. Uh, I'm not saying that it's impossible. So this is one uh, uh, idea for me to figure it out, how we could uh, regulate the future that is not uh, here yet. But um, uh, I guess it's, uh, uh, the first step here is not to be late. Uh, it would be already an accomplishment if uh, me with the team and, and other colleagues uh, uh, would, would come out, out timely with uh, short guidance, some explanations, uh, even training events, uh, and therefore having this dialogue, open dialogue, uh, uh, with the market participants uh, and uh, building the, the way to the future together. 
Um, I do have a, a private sector background in that sense that I largely, I think I know what I'm doing, uh, also from, from the banking perspective. Um, uh, but the truth is that obviously the world is changing uh, 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 fast. So, uh, and uh, there is not a single person who could be always up to date the most uh, recent developments. And uh, that's the beauty of the game. So uh, we need to do it together. And having this dialogue and then frequent interaction, not to be afraid of each other, because eventually we are actually on the same side. So, David, I wanted to ask you about the impact of these imaginary at this point new technologies uh, that might have on your business and also the challenges around the protection of data. And again, this is the, the audience is beating me to it every time. There's another question here asking, why should I share such sensitive data with an unknown, and maybe not properly supervised company? There is a need for trust, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think one of, I mentioned two, the two drivers that I see is uh, data and the digital economy and data is certainly at the core of, of, of the present and the future, I think, right? Um, um, we, have, uh, we have an ambitious agenda in Europe in terms of um, opening, opening data, which wasn't the case uh, a few years ago, and that is in process. We have, um, I would say, um, the Digital Market Act, the uh, DA, and the Open Finance. Uh, we had before the PSD2, now PSD3. So we, we have a number of pieces of legislation that are in, 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 the, in, the, in the business of, of, opening, of opening the data um, across industries, and not only, not only in the financial industry, but also across industry. And that's going to generate a new economy. That's what we call it, the data, the data economy. Um, that has um, benefit. Uh, opportunities brings opportunities, but also has challenges for the for the industry, right? Um, in terms of the opportunities, the additional data that the banking industry doesn't have and hopefully will get through uh, the, this um, uh, new framework will allow them to be more efficient in terms of operation. Will allow them to uh, design better products for the clients because they will know the clients better than they do already, um, and. Um, and, um, and it, it would allow them to assess risk in a better way with more information, not just the information that they have on their, on their record. So it has you know, a, a potential enormous benefits for, for the, for the uh, players in the banking industry. But also it comes with challenges. Uh, the challenges are that, as it happened with, I think in the last 10 years, uh, we've seen a lot of um, you know, concentration in the traditional banks, but we've seen a lot of new things happening in the payment Area and I think PSD two is, uh, is is partially responsible for that. It has you know has brought uh, new uh, I bring, I'll say it again new animals in the room that were not there. Uh, I think open finance will bring even more animals in the room. We don't we don't we don't we don't we cannot think of now new business models. So I think it's it's a great opportunity for banks, but it's a great opportunity for uh, new players that are, have not been born yet and will be born as a result of open finance. Uh, so so I think. Uh, uh, Open, open data will bring uh, more competition for banks. Uh, I, I would say banks are in a good position. They have a lot of data already. Maybe not so much as the big tech, for instance, although those, those business, play, those business um, that have um, placed themselves at the center of the data, they generate data, so, but maybe the banks have to change. They, I think that they're not, they're not too bad uh, position to do that. And, uh, and, and, and lastly, I think the challenges are in, in managing that data. So there, there is the issue of um, uh, intellectual property and, and, and the protection mm -hmm. of businesses. So, so there should be some protection there for it's not a free lunch where information will flow anywhere. So that, that information needs to be uh, duly protected. Uh, and also um, GDPR and also uh, personal data as well has to be. So it's, there's a balance between opening up the economy, creating a new economy, which is going to benefit everyone, uh, um, public, public authorities, banks, other companies, customers, and at the same time, uh, protecting data that is sensitive and, and trust. And trust is the definition of, of a bank. Yeah. Uh, so I think they're, you know, uh, if, if they play the cards right, I think they, they, ha they have very good credentials to, to be at the center of this new economy. Marilyn. 
Uh, I want to, I want to create a, an image for the future. So, as a citizen, uh, if we could have a digital wallet where all our data is literally placed, and obviously I'm owner of my own data, and I can pick what type of data with whom I want to share, and I also may choose to withdraw that. Uh, and uh, the question of trust is it's really up to me to decide whether I, I, I trust uh, the small player, uh, some innovative uh, uh, startup, or I, I'm more traditional. I, I want to have a, a, a company with old traditions, with uh, long legacy uh, uh, partnering with me. But uh, the question is, you know, what I get uh, as a return, because I give my data, uh, whether uh, I uh, experience then... Uh, uh, super user-friendly environment where all the transactions and all my financial affairs would be managed on behalf of me. Maybe I would be interested. But I may be also more conservative side and say that I don't actually want to share my data. I want to uh, do my own transactions. I want to make my own decisions. I don't need any predictive models, algorithms, and etc. So I guess uh, the, the um, a picture for the future is really... Uh, for the citizen to decide where, how, and when uh, we are sharing our data. And based on that, obviously, different things could be built on. Thank you. Well, Patricia, uh, to build on, as well on what Marilyn is saying, um, a lot of these sort of services that we're talking about sound like they're going in the direction of democratising finance and providing mm -hmm. access to those 30 million or so people, as you said, mm -hmm. maybe or are not connected. They all build on the backs of other things, such as access to online services, access to the internet, and a, a educative knowledge to understand how to use it. How do we build all of that into our societies uh, with the idea of keeping the trust there? Um, yeah, I think, of course, trust is extremely um, uh, important. And um, like Marilyn said, as a as a consumer, eh, you must of course give your consent, eh, and 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 you have full control on to whom eh, you will you will uh, uh, give that uh, that uh, uh, data. Of course, when then when then I look at tomorrow, <laughs> we will have this uh, of course hopefully widely uh, spread new technology that it's uh, called uh, blockchain and it is also this distributed ledger because it's controlled by a community and you can't break you can't change anything that will also provide those trust i never say technology always needs to serve a purpose or the business problem, or uh, a customer's issue, or, or whatever. You mustn't do blockchain for, hey, I'm a bank and I'm doing a blockchain project. Eh? That's, that's, that's not the aim, not, not to have a sustainable uh, future. But technologies like blockchain can also help to build that uh, uh, trust and, and build it within society and have a decentralized financial uh, system. And I'm also very curious how that will relate then to our hopefully very strong European uh, banking union. Well, I see here uh, an audience question that in fact uh, Marilyn answered and I've only just noticed it. <laughs> if data is the new gold, what will you pay me as a consumer? Yeah. I think... Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps it's it's in terms like you know ease of use, choice and flexibility. I think is uh, probably the answers that that you were summarising there. Um, another question that we've got coming in that's uh, that's getting a lot of thumbs up is, could you talk about the compatibility of digitalisation with ESG developments, Patricia? Perhaps you could touch on that. And yes, that's a, a very very important uh, uh, topic and issue. Of of course, eh? we all read it in the newspaper that, of course, the, the, the Bitcoin eh, is kind of the worst, uh, worst electronic eh, the crypto money mm. that uh, 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 there is. Um, absolutely, that's true. It's uh, uh, um, consuming uh, too much uh, energy. Uh, mining, Bitcoin miners are also 
in, let's say, uh, 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 some exotic uh, locations where there is no real uh, sustainable green economy that is already present. Uh, they, they, they even reopen, I've read, uh, old uh, 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 carbon um, electricity, uh, I think, uh, pro providers. So that's not a good thing. But um, hey, Bitcoin already exists uh, for, for several years. In this, like I said, innovation, it's, it's, it comes in waves and it evolves all the time. So now we also have other uh, uh, blockchain technology like, like Ether with mm. Ethereum. And you have the famous uh, proof of work and the proof of work to add up on the blockchain. That's what demands so much electricity and computing power, of course. And now we evolve also to, to the proof of stake, what's less form, more uh, less uh, uh, um, electricity uh, uh, consuming. So, of course, we are evolving. And I also think um, that uh, um, if I may speak eh, for, the, for, the, for the fintech uh, uh, community and the startup community, I think all those people are taking uh, ESG very, very seriously. And also, uh, um, I know even uh, also fintechs who are even also specialized in ESG reporting, in making all the requirements also more clearly transparent also for an investor, uh, if you want to invest upon it. So yes, there is a lot of criticism and a lot of things can be improved, but we are aware. I think the community is fully aware of, of, of ESG. And I think it, yeah, it's a bit now with the real economy. There is a target and everybody is moving and trying to reach the target. Well, of course, it's not just crypto yeah. mining. It's, no. it's all this data that we're talking about has to be stored and processed somewhere, which is, is energy intensive. But on the flip side, you may find that actually being able to offer a more sustainable product is a, is a selling point to, to the next generation who are concerned. Um, let's look at one of the other issues that cryptocurrencies have. They're sometimes seen uh, with the undertones of criminality, David. Um, and, you know, there's uh, sometimes reputational issues there. Let's talk about bad actors in general and, and, the, and the, the problems that we may see in, in sort of weeding those out. What do you see as being the future in 2040? What, what will that look like? Uh, I think... Um um, I, I was thinking um, that, that the crypto or blockchain started about the same time as the banking union, but with <laughs> the, the, quite, a different, <laughs> quite a different career where we are today. Um, it's not a very good uh, moment to talk about crypto right now. Um, I think um, my experience is that, um, that, that obviously it's been a, a story of success and, and, and a lot of the actors in the banking community are looking with attention because well it, it looks very appealing the clients are asking for to get uh, um, some part of the action as well so they feel the pressure but I think they're also very concerned that uh, they're in a different position that those guys that are you know um, at the helm of the of the of the crypto industry um, so very very uh, I think that the whole industry is expecting the, the, the first regulation in Europe uh, Mika I don't know if it's going to be Mika 2 we just you know we'll be happy if we have Mika 1 for the time being and I think that's you know we'll see what happens with it's very early on in terms of the, where the technology is so I think I think the technology has to evolve um, in the same way that internet has taken 20 years to where we are today so it's difficult to predict whether this technology uh, with the um, uh, energy consumption and stuff is going to stay here forever. It has a very good attributes. The, na the very nature of, of crypto is, is a challenge for banks. They centralize, so the role of, of a bank is to centralize uh, between two sides, and this is the centralized could be a challenge. But I think when people think about crypto, they just think about or blockchain, they think about crypto, but I think there are other uses that are super interesting for the industry, like um, in, in areas like trade finance or smart contracts, or complex transaction where there is where there is uh, uh, mistrust between the parties. I think uh, it, it, we will it will add um, uh, it will make a lot of sense to use that technology and, and, and for the industry to embrace it in certain areas. Um, we'll see what happens with profits in those areas. Uh, but 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 uh, I see um, I see crypto as a as a sort of blockchain as, a, as an emerging um, technology uh, together with with the new version of internet uh, 3.0 and and, and and artificial intelligence and other and other technologies um, so so I'm sure banks will will embrace it and I hope that after we have a 
uh, a proper regulation, they will, um, they will enter into that um, digital economy uh, and with them the clients and in a safe environment. Um, Yes, Helen. Yeah, uh, so I, I may compl uh, compliment uh, a bit. Uh, being myself uh, close to 20 years chasing criminals in, in different roles. So, uh, and um, I would uh, uh, just point out it, it's, it's not about the particular uh, mean uh, how funds are transferred. Really, being a young professional, uh, we, we saw a huge amount of falsified banknotes. Uh, later, uh, just paper documents uh, uh, forged. Uh, and it, it, obviously, this criminal uh, kind of life and criminal uh, way of, of living and, and uh, acting, this is also developing, uh, among other things. So um, I would say that um, uh, it's not directly related to the crypto or non-crypto. Non so this is just another way of uh, and transacting. There could be uh, analog to the crypto or even the fourth way of transacting in the future. And whatever is, is the mean, we always should think about the risks and the uh, basic principles we need to introduce. So, and th that's the challenge with innovation that um, what is this one page maybe short overview of key principles we all should be aware of and follow, even if we don't really know what is this innovation or new product solution is about. Um, and that's the regulatory challenge, obviously. So that uh, how to be proactive enough, relevant enough, timely enough for the market participants. So um, using the professional judgment, uh, sometimes cut feeling how things could go wrong, etc. cetera. So, um, I'm happy, obviously, to spend hours uh, on, on uh, uh, criminal minds and the investigations, but most probably this is not the topic for the <laughs> banking 2040. Well, I did want to ask you uh, on that. I mean, you mentioned gut feeling. AI doesn't have any guts. But um, is there a potential for using some of these machine learning or AI or predictive algorithms to combat money laundering or, or fraud? Mm -hmm. I may obviously take the topic uh, that, yes, uh, artificial intelligence uh, and, and uh, obviously it's one of the kind of elements, machine learning, uh, which is uh, a more understandable way or understandable uh, way of, of uh, applying technology. Um, in a way, it, it has gut feeling because uh, it's, it's a supervised uh, uh, application of artificial intelligence, which is kind of rule based and, and it's learning uh, based on historical patterns and, and uh, information that is given. Um, but uh, unsupervised uh, artificial intelligence uh, kind of learns itself. You know, you don't really know uh, how and when and based on what. And uh, uh, in that sense that... Uh, particularly in the money, uh, money laundering, uh, terrorist financing, uh, uh, primary corruption, fraud investigation area, uh, any technology that would support analyzing a uh, huge amount of data and uh, suggesting uh, maybe red flags, uh, items to, to follow up is uh, very helpful. And I do know that there is already uh, practices out there uh, which are supporting uh, investigation compliance teams uh, to do their tasks. Well, David, you've worked on resolution. The same sort of question to you. Do you see an area where new technologies or, 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 or you know, new services might actually be able to help in the area of resolution? Um, Certainly, in, 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 in what is called the management information system, so kind of like the I think I think like supervision or resolution without information are very uh, are you know are just not possible. You will be doing your job based based on imperfect or past information. Mm -hmm. So I think the fact that the new technology will allow you to have real time access to the whatever you're supervising uh, should make the the job easier. So I think yes, of course, I think. Uh, um, um, uh, banking resolution or supervision should, all, should evolve with the industry that they supervise. So if, if the industry is moving in, in, in that direction, they should also move in that direction. Otherwise, there will be a disconnection between, between both. At this point, I want to see if we've got any questions in the room. Just 
If you can raise your hand if there's a question you will want to ask, yes. Any others so I get a sense? Okay, two. So we'll start over here in the centre, please. Thank you. It would be a rather a uh, question to Patricia. Uh, one remark and one question. Um, you mentioned uh, we will have a lot of data. Um, maybe it's my professional damage, but a lot of data is not necessarily good. Um, I mean, the data reliable, the quality of the data, it's something different than just a lot of data, right? Um, and that's why um, my um, question, uh, you mentioned when we have a lot of data, speaking about the blockchain, and the data is there and not changeable. When we think about the bailing, for example, so you do have to do some changes to the data. And um, here is my question. What um, chances and uh, risks do you see coming from the open finance and blockchain, for example? Because we do have to foresee all the risks and try to mitigate them. Thank you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, of course, that's, that's a good one because, yeah, of course, I'm also not a fortune teller, but like I, like I said, we, we, we need the data to have this innovation eh, going and, and, and also we need the regulation because we need the standardization. Of course, um, in my perception, data standardization is also enhancing data uh, uh, quality, eh, make it uh, uh, um, exchangeable eh, between, between uh, uh, all parties. And of course, keep the data secure eh? here in Europe. We have, of course, the GDPR uh, uh, data, the, the, the privacy, the, the personal data. That's a very, very important one. Eh? Of course, if you look at uh, uh, the US, eh? you, you all know the big tech, eh? the, the, the discussions uh, eh? that, uh, that there already have been. Um, yeah, but I think it's important for uh, 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 the protection. Um, it needs to uh, remain in confident hands. And there comes uh, the trust again. I think the blockchain technology uh, uh, will, will for sure enhance the trust. Indeed, there is a small, small is issue when it becomes on privacy because GDPR says, hey, you have, I have the right to be forgotten, yeah. I just like I just said, the blockchain never will forget. Once it's stored in the blockchain, you can't simply uh, erase it. But I think that's just a small issue, and for sure we will have a workaround or work this out or make eh, make that that it will uh, uh, work. But we need to protect also uh, uh, the EU because if. If you look, it was also said that the, 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 the uh, EU is looking uh, maybe for a digital stablecoin. Um, it was also in the press uh, recently that Circle now is launching a, uh, a euro-backed stablecoin in the States, where, of course, our legislation don't apply and they are keeping uh, a euro-backed uh, uh, reserves in premises, of course, in the United States with their financial institutions. The blockchain, the internet, there are no boundaries. So therefore, we must also protect here eh, our, our, to have a strong uh, um, digital economy, but a European also economy, because we know to whom we are competing. We are competing with states. We are, of course, competing with Asia. And as the internet and certainly Web 3.0 has no boundaries, yeah, we, we must secure eh, our own uh, financial stability, uh, stability, not only, of course, for the banks, but also for the future, for decentralized uh, finance, for the ledgers. Thank you for the question. <laughs> I would love to talk about GDR for, GDPR for days, but we will take our second question over here, please. Thanks a lot. Um, no, it was a, a lot in line with the previous question on, on indeed data quality and data sources. And how far are we from uh, really having uh, good data? Because we still see uh, a lot of concerns in terms of data quality. Um, also, we see uh, standardization is still not there. So will taxonomies help? 
um, what do you see happening uh, there? Because when we, we, we try to pull that uh, together, we need to make sure that we are talking about the same things. Uh, and um, how, how do you see this evolving? And um, um, it, how far are we? So is it something for the next two, five years, ten years, or is it only for 2040, as you are talking about 2040 banking? Thank you. Uh, Patricia, I think that's probably directed at you again. <laughs> you can give a short yeah, but answer. I know you don't know what's going to happen in 2040. No, 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 I sure, I, I don't know, but I do know that we need this legal framework because that will help with the standardization. Um, if uh, uh, there isn't any legal framework, like we see, uh, we see Meta and Microsoft already teaming up uh, to create their own standardization. Uh, that, of course, also uh, uh, will help. But we need to standardize. Also, we have uh, uh, that many uh, crypto uh, uh, currencies. For sure, there will be uh, um, there will be uh, currencies that will be completely obsolete, along with some uh, maybe uh, uh, let's say some digital economies. But there will be the next wave, and there will be then a, a, a bigger community with better data, with where there is, uh, for instance, this uh, interoperability, eh, so that you can go from one metaverse uh, to another. Um, but maybe to give you an, uh, already a clue on the um, speed of innovation, uh, recently Gartner stated that in 2025, uh, we will spend each one hour in a metaverse universe, a Web 3.0. So that's not that very near future. So imagine what in 20 years the financial landscape will look like. Well, I've just got a couple of questions online that are very linked, mm -hmm. uh, asking is there enough interaction between developers and regulators? Uh, in this dialogue, as someone else has pointed out, EBA, ECB, SRB, DG FISMA, national central banks, national finance departments, who do new technologists and developers interact with? <laughs> what advice do you have for them, David? On how to interact? Yeah, and who to interact with. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think that when we see in in, um, in my organization, we've seen uh, the profiles of people working there changing very quickly. I mean, we have more engineers, engineer, engineers, uh, data scientists, and 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 people like that that are you know uh, specialists in the areas that we're talking. If we think that the future is in the data economy or the digital economy, you certainly need more of those people rather than lawyers or economists. And as I said before, possibly supervisors should be doing the same thing and, and, and kind of like enrich their um, human capital with people that are able to understand that language and, and are kind of like not too distant from what is happening, right? Otherwise, um, it could happen like with the crypto, you know, that there's a big, big market happening and then the regulation hasn't arrived yet. So, so I think that we should try to ideally, by engaging in a dialogue, uh, limit the time between what's going on in the market and the regulation and supervision that comes after. Well, I think we're almost at the end of time, but um, since we're looking at the future and looking into crystal balls and dealing in magic, um, if I have my magic wand to wave and grant each of you a wish for whatever you want in the banking regulation in the EU by 2040, what would it be, Patricia? Um, yeah, like I said, it must be open uh, finance. And then if we have that, then technology can do its job, whether it's uh, AI or uh, uh, machine learning or blockchain or whatever. Of course, uh, um, let's say new, new business model, new economies um, that, will, uh, that will help. And maybe... Just I want to touch one one point because uh, um, I do have also uh, uh, comments from the fintech community with uh, supervisors. Yep. I think it's very important that uh, that the learning, training, and of course understanding and building trust. Eh, it all relates also uh, uh, to the, the team maybe also of of the day. Too much I hear it that that it's purely a uh, uh, one one way conversation. Eh? And you need, you need to be compliant, you need to comply. But there are also other possibilities, like, for instance, uh, maybe the UK is a good example. 
Um, there uh, you also have the regulatory sandboxes, uh, which are not here uh, present in, uh, in Belgium. And I hear it's more like a uh, two-way conversation, trying to understand each other. And they also try to think along, of course, within the regulatory framework, but you need to understand each other. And I think it will also be not a bad idea, maybe also to engage some more technical, eh? uh, uh, skilled uh, uh, people who know uh, uh, the technology and what to do with it. Because f for most of the people, it's like a black box. It's not transparent. But that's not what the fintech community wants. We want also to be. That's okay. Open up. <laughs> yeah. okay. okay, my magic wand got yeah. lost. David, um, <laughs> Sorry. what would you like as your wish? Uh, I think if... Uh, uh, Looking into the future, I think maybe maybe um, I was looking banking union. I take it on. Maybe in the future it will be financial service, financial services union because the way we see it is it looks already a bit old. I mean maybe when it was um, we have insurance, we have asset management, we have banking, but I think things have changed a lot. We have new players, we have uh, smaller players, we have payments. I think that, as I said before, there's a lot of things happening in the payment space, and we will have more of those, especially going forward. So I think. Banks had a you know dominant position in the past. I think it was a decision made here in Brussels that they shouldn't it shouldn't be like that in the future. And uh, maybe we can have a you know a more comprehensive view of regulation and supervision with the bodies talking to each other more. Uh, um, there are so many people doing things for the industry that is difficult to cope. I have a you know unified comprehensive view uh, that is positive for the industry, that is positive for the for the for the customers. So that would be my. I know it's difficult, uh, but that would be my wish. And Marilyn? Yes, so uh, the question for me, obviously, uh, uh, is not uh, what I would expect from the regulation, but uh, how uh, I plan to execute or how we write guidelines in the future. And here I would, uh, uh, I, I do have a dream, and then one, uh, one of those dreams is that uh, uh, if there is any entrepreneurs uh, listening uh, or people with innovative ideas. So it's uh, obviously very welcome that you implement your idea, you understand that there is a market, there is a scale, but then it, it would be very, very helpful if you have, let's say, a one-page description, what type of guidance or regulatory challenges you are facing with your innovative idea, and also that uh, you would come and uh, present your challenges so we would actually understand and we will have a dialogue as we are connected uh, with all the stakeholders so for us it's not a challenge to uh, uh, sit on the same table with the ECB or SRB or national competent authorities we're all there but what we are time to time missing is really understanding what is the, the developments in the market side and the, what type of challenge you're facing. So where you need this guidance and glad to think along. Well, thank you all very much. Um, I actually don't have a magic wand, so I won't be granting your wishes. And we don't know. 2040 is still quite a long time away. And I like to remind everyone when I finish a panel, when we're looking to the future, when we're talking about innovation, that we just don't know. Edison didn't invent the light bulb by trying to make a more effective candle. So anything could happen. All bets are off. But thank you very much for your attention, for your questions, and a big round of applause to our panellists. Thank you. <laughs>